Hi again, I'm Jack Lessenberry, and welcome, or I hope welcome back, to Politics and Prejudices, the podcast. This is sort of an evolution of the column I wrote and the radio commentaries I did for many years, so I hope you enjoy and keep listening. You can also catch up with both my writing and any essays and podcasts you might have missed on my website and blog, LessonberryInc.com. That's ink as an ink pen. One of the best things about being a journalist is the fascinating folks you meet along the way and the fascinating complex stories they're often part of, and I see this as a chance to share them with you. So please settle back and listen and stay tuned afterwards for my signature essay. Hope you enjoy, and again, please follow me and catch up at any episodes you might have missed on my blog, LessonburyInc.com. Now for today's topic. We tend in this country to, pardon the expression, ghettoize black history to treat it as something important perhaps, but separate and apart from everything else. I've met many college-educated young people who knew, for example, that black folks were once slaves, that Martin Luther King made a famous speech called I Have a Dream, and that there were riots in the 60s, that segregation ended and Barack Obama got elected president, and as far as black history goes, that's about it. But in fact, fact black history and black history in Detroit and Michigan is richly textured, endlessly interesting, and completely interwoven with all our history in a way few people know. I used to say that people should study African-American history because it needed to know it. Today, I think that instead we should all study it because it's not only relevant, but absolutely fascinating. And joining me today to talk about all this are three of the best experts in Detroit. Ken Coleman is joining us on the phone, is a man I think of as sort of a living encyclopedia of African-American history in this area. He's written a number of books on this topic. Dr. Keith Dye is professor of African-American studies at the University of Michigan Dearborn. He's an expert at activism and freedom movements in the 1960s and the Detroit beginnings of the reparations movement. And Dr. Howard Lindsay is a historian and Michigan native who taught for many years at DePaul University in Chicago. He is the expert on Henry Ford and the rise of Inkster and the author of A History of Black America. Gentlemen, thank you all for making time for us today. Thank well, you. Appreciate it. it. Absolutely. Yeah, Ken, so we have, we have you remotely. Tell us a little bit about uh, how you see your role in sort of uh, educating folks about the history of the area. I appreciate the opportunity, Jack. Thanks for having me on, and and uh, to the distinguished uh, 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 colleagues, if you will, on the broadcast. Good, good, good to good to hear from you both. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, my career um, started out as uh, as a journalist, um, a newspaper reporter at the Michigan Chronicle. Um, for those that don't know, that is the state's uh, largest African American newspaper, uh, founded in 1936. Uh, my days there started uh, in 1992, 1993, excuse me, and covering the news on a daily basis and writing for a weekly, an African American weekly, Jack, um, I uh, almost on a story by story basis not only covered the news in real time, but had an opportunity to learn about the great history of this town, uh, in particular, um, the great history of this town. Uh, that involved African Americans, and I think those were some of the early, uh, sort of the early seeds of my interest in, in chronicling Black life in Detroit. Uh, and while I've worked on a variety of different uh, projects, sometimes political campaigns, sometimes I've gone back to reporting now at MichiganAdvance.com. Um, um, but whether it's been that or doing Black history tours around the city. Um, I've really developed uh, a love and an affinity for for chronicling this history, and I've been doing that, uh, Jack, uh, um, for about the last uh, seven or eight years now. That's that's fascinating. You know, Dr. Keith Dye, you're still you're still teaching. You've won a bunch of teaching awards. Is it easy to interest kids in African American history? Uh, it is. Uh, <clears throat> if you're able to present it in a way where uh, they see the the relevance of it. And where it ties in, uh, uh, into their lives, mm -hmm. I think it's pretty easy. Uh, in particular, they, they they seem to have an affinity for the spectacular moment, right. uh, those individuals or events that occurred that they've heard about but don't know too much about, and so they want to know more about it. And so, you, you know, you, if you have that in there, your your lecture and your lesson plans, then it's very easy to to you might say lure them into African American history. Um, but you got to make it, you know, you got to put that little sauce on it, so to speak. Right, right. And uh, as long as you do that, and then they understand the the projection of the history. You can't say memorize these names and dates. <laughs> <laughs> <They're gone. laughs> they have a tough time with dates, sure. you know. Yeah, yeah. Howard Lindsay, you've been uh, fascinated by the study subject, writing about it, teaching about it your whole life. If someone said to you, tell me one 
fascinating thing about African American history in Detroit or Michigan, like Dennis Archer, you're from the west side of Michigan. What would it be? What do you think is the most fascinating and comparatively unknown thing? You mean about Detroit? About Detroit, about Afri Detroit, Michigan, what, whatever. Well, um, like I said, I did my dissertation on Inkster, a uh, little town outside Detroit. <clears throat> and um, the fascinating uh, relationship between Inkster and Henry Ford. And Henry Ford basically uh, took over the town during the Depression. He built houses, he built churches, right. he built schools. But what I was amazed at was what the African Americans of Inkster did. Um, when the uh, town was first organized uh, and they had the Charter Commission, uh, the uh, commission supposedly inadvertently left off the name of the only black candidate. Hmm. Well, the blacks organized, uh, had a write-in campaign, got uh, the uh, gentleman on the ballot. He was elected of the... Uh, kind of like Mike Duggan in reverse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Jack. Very good. Very good. I'm, I'm not going to touch that, Al. <laughs> You're a smarter man than I am. <laughs> but I was amazed at, at, at how involved they were. They were on the police force. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, city councils, uh, I think they run two-year terms between uh, the 1920s and the time Inks became a city. Um, I think there were only three times that blacks were on the uh, city council. And it was, you know, I went, when I first went into the uh, research, I thought, okay, well, this is going to be, you know, some offshoot of Detroit. And right. and that. But the people had a, had a uh, pride of themselves. And that's what impressed me. Now, didn't Henry Ford have the idea that Inkster would be where his black workers would live? Yes, yes, uh, segregated, right. segregated. Right. But uh, even though it was segregated, um, the people in Inkster, the, the African Americans in Inkster, did much, much better than almost any place else in uh, southeastern Michigan. Uh, this was a middle class black community. It was working class to right. some extent because most of the people right. there would work, you know, worked at Ford. Right. And at Ford's, they, you know, with, with most of the blacks, they worked in the uh, foundry, which was the dirtiest. Right. But the other thing is that was the most essential. Right. So it was almost... Uh, but they were paid the same, weren't they, or pretty much the same? Yes, they were paid the same. Uh, the people that, that worked, uh, that enrolled in his program, uh, he paid them $5 a day, <clears throat> and that was an offshoot of the $5 a day program. Right. But he kept $4 to pay back the debt. Ah. But anything they needed, for the most part... Uh, Ford provided for. For the debt, you mean like mortgages? Yes, so, mortgages. It was almost like his little colony. It was. Right. It, yeah. was. Well, it was. It yeah. was. Mm -hmm. You know, I want everyone to respond to this, but I want to start with Ken Coleman. You know, Morgan Freeman once said, he was interviewed by Mike Wallace. I'm going to talk about that in an essay. And Mike Wallace said, what do you think of Black History Month? He said, I don't want a Black History Month. He says, Black, Black History is American history. He sort of resented it being sort of relegated to one month. What do you think about that, Ken? Well, I, I agree with Freeman. Um, it, uh, you know, the uh, quick history, all of you know, but but uh, Black History Month really is an offshoot of Black History Week, uh, and the great historian Carter G. Woodson, an African American, um, and really was the sort of uh, really was sort of the driving force in identifying February that first that week right. in February, uh, and it was designed to to highlight uh, Frederick Douglass, the African American abolitionist. Was that his birthday uh, or something? I mean, it started off yeah, as African American birthday Week. for yeah. Douglas right. and and for uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln, right? Um, and who effectively freed the slaves as president? Um, but that's how it, that's that that it's how February started. But 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 to you know the, to to go back to a Freeman's point and the question that you're asking, I, I believe that we need to celebrate this history uh, every day, like we celebrate history of other people every day. Um, I, uh, I I'm a, a big sort of advocate of using um, sort of pop um, social media uh, social media uh, platforms like Facebook and Twitter to every day share a nugget or two about. Um, history in this town. Uh, I like that. I'm a, subscri I'm a subscriber. Folks. I've learned a lot from those. Yeah, yeah I mean, <laughs> and, I, and I think that what happens, hopefully what happens, Jack, is that these are little nuggets, but they, right. but they, but they encourage people and cause people in some cases to yeah. go find uh, out more right. than the, you know, the 200 sure. characters or, you know, the couple paragraphs right. that, I, that I add. I think we ought to celebrate it every day. I do believe that black history is American history, although I, I also feel like 
um, you know, contemporary American society really relegates black history to February. Right. Uh, and I push back on that. Well, I'm glad somebody once said, as a black man I know once said, you knew they'd give us the shortest month in the calendar. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Keith Dye, what do you think about that? Uh, I will kind of depart from that just a bit. Okay. Uh, I think that the um, uh, Carly Wooden's idea of, of uh, having a week of black mm -hmm. history and then right. ultimately being a month uh, is a good idea. Uh, uh, certainly it's part of American history, but also it's part of world history as well and right. African history. And because African history has, had been marginalized or uh, suppressed, sometimes you have to have a, uh, an emphasis or, or focus to bring it out. And I think the idea of having it in February or any month for that matter is uh, a good idea. Um, so I don't see anything wrong with it. I, I would disagree for, with Morgan Freeman, though I do understand his sentiment. But uh, I think that one has to take a broader and more in-depth look at African American history, as you do other histories, and say, well, how can we highlight it to bring more attention to it? And then from there, you can spread it out through the other months of the year. So February is a good idea. So this is, you know, nothing wrong with it. Uh, certainly, it's, it's part of American history, but there's a broader perspective here that should be considered. You know, Dr. Howard Lindsay, you and I are old enough to remember well when, well, all I was taught about African American history in elementary school was about George Washington Carver and the Peanuts. And we've come a long way. Yeah, we have. Um, I don't think we've come uh, as far as I think we need to go. Right. And uh, I'd like to pick up on, on Dr. Dye's point also. Uh, yes, uh, African American history is American history, but uh, it does not preclude us from highlighting sure. for one month the accomplishments. I mean, you know, the Irish are pr proud of themselves. You know, they have the Irish parade, you know, right. the, uh, Columbus Day, and, yeah, St. Patrick's Day and whatnot. So I, I don't see a, uh, a problem with it. The other thing is, since we have not come that far in one sense that uh, African-American history has not become a part of the mainstream, it gives us then at least uh, one month to kind of highlight that. I mean, when I was growing up, you know, um, back in the uh, 50s, you know, I remember, you know, there was Negro History Week, but when I looked at my textbooks, you know, there was nothing in there about African Americans, except, right. for, you know, around slavery, and then, you know, maybe George Washington Carver might get, but otherwise, you know, nothing, nothing. And if you look at most of the high school history books today, uh, you still don't see that much about African Americans. Uh, again, the slavery thing, you know, they might include George Washington Carver and Booker T. Washington, which people get mixed up. Right. Um, you don't see enough, in my opinion, about Marcus Garvey, uh, Mary Pilar Bethune, right. all those uh, names that um, uh, in African-American history are commonplace. But if you ask the general public outside right. of that uh, field, um, there's, there's almost no uh, knowledge of them. That, that's right. And that's something. Ken, you're trying to change that, aren't you? Yeah, one of the things I'm proud of, at least from the local history inclusion standpoint, is uh, about a year and a half ago I met with uh, uh, Dr. Nikolai Viti, who is the uh, general superintendent of the Detroit Public Schools. I uh, met with him, uh, actually it was two years ago this month, I uh, met with him uh, and encouraged him at that time um, to, um, to add more local history uh, into uh, the, the, the Detroit Public School curriculum. Um, uh, his team, he agreed with me, went to work on that, and his team produced um, a pilot project that started last February in K through 5, kindergarten through 5 schools, to include more local history. Now, that, that, that includes um, not just uh, African-American history in Detroit, but, 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 but other history, you know, it, you know, history that sort of occurred, you know, out, outside of uh, African-Americans. But I saw it as a... Um, and I think that VT saw it as uh, a, a sort of opportunity to begin to to write um, what my colleagues on the panel are, are, are suggesting, a, you know, a, a wrong that's been carried out, that um, that there isn't enough uh, inclusion, um, local inclusion. Uh, I'll remind um, uh, the three of you, and I know Keith was probably part of this uh, in the 80s, you know, the Detroit Public Schools through through board edict, uh, in the uh, beginning in the mid to late 80s, uh, and began to move toward an African-centered curriculum, uh, and ultimately produced three or four schools uh, that were African-centered. 
uh, the board, uh, through resolution at that time, 30 years ago, suggested that that ought to be the 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 the, uh, the, the move of the day, if you will, or the 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 Supreme Court of day for the entire district. The district never got there, um, and so there's still work to be done uh, in that regard. Well, let me ask all of you: What does that mean when you say an Afrocentric theme in these schools? Yeah. What does that mean, and what should it mean? Well, the idea of Afrocentric. Well, hey, Ken. Yeah, hey, how you doing? Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll let you go first, because I know you, you were in, I, was, I was a young reporter at the time, but you were, you were involved in it in a strong way. Uh, yeah. the, uh, uh, the idea of Afro, Afrocentrism, uh, in fact, I taught at one of the schools that opened up in, in, at the time, uh, Aisha Shulite, which became the W.E.B. Mm -hmm. w. Du Bois Academy. Uh, the whole idea of it is to give African Americans or black people in general uh, some sense of centeredness. Right. That is, to be able to view the world from how it impacted them rather than how they were being incorporated into the world and then they, they kind of fizzle out. But to uh, uh, give them a sense of rootedness, a sense of being centered and how they view the world and their surroundings. And that in includes sociology, history, political science, and other fields as well. And so uh, Afrocentrism means that they simply have a perspective on the world where they place themselves at the center so that they can understand it more properly and see how they fit into that world picture and they're at the same time be able to determine their own destiny in a way where they function in an in uh, independent manner, not with the idea of oppressing other people, right. but with the idea of achieving their own sense of self-determination. It's kind of like Globes in Australia show you know, the world, what we would say, upside down. They show the Southern Hemisphere on top and the Northern Hemisphere yeah. at the bottom. What do you think, Howard Lindsay? Uh, first of all, let me just say this in terms of um, the whole Afrocentric uh, argument. When I taught at Highland Park Community College for almost 20 years, and one of the progressive things that the board did was to mandate uh, in the college, in the curriculum, an African, an African history course. And that was one of the few uh, times that I had heard of almost any community college right. uh, teaching African history. But uh, along with Dr. Dye's point, uh, Afrocentrism means you put black people at the center of your whole narrative. Right. For instance, when I teach my African American history course, uh, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, okay, they were le legitimate American heroes. But from my perspective, also the way I teach it, they were also slaveholders. Right and something even more than slaveholding. Um, the fact that, of course, we have descendants of Jefferson now, which opens up a whole new uh, line of discussion. So Afrocentrism means you are looking, you, we can take the same people, the same dates even, uh, and we look at them from a different perspective. So George Washington in the US history textbooks, of course, is the father of the country. In another sense, he was also a slaveholder. And he supported an institution that had lasted almost 200 years. So, um, you know, when you look at it from that perspective, um, th there is now a balance. You see, uh, so and we leave it. And I leave it to the students. Okay, what was it? Can you um, uh, categorize it? Right. Even with Henry Ford, uh, and I talk about. Him, Staunch segregationist. He did not believe in integration at all. And a raving anti Semite. We could and an anti Semite. That's right. <laughs> but he probably did more for black people than any other industrialist. Um, are you suggesting people are complicated? Uh, <laughs> just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I say absolutely. I say absolutely so. I mean, um, Henry Ford is the sort of quintessential complicated figure, right? We've right. talked about. You know uh, the history of Inkster. We talked about the five dollars a day and the foundry plants, and and you know the whole the whole. I mean, he helped he helped bring about uh, in a very in a, in a very real sense, at least in this part of the country, uh, the black migration. I mean, my right. grandparents mm -hmm. on both mm -hmm. sides moved here from Alabama and Mississippi, and they worked at, um, worked for Mr. Ford. And they worked at yeah, Ford's. Yeah, or as we said, Ford's. Right. With an right. <laughs> but but uh, but no, I mean, but but Ford was very complicated. I mean, he and people like Father Coughlin, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, through, exactly. you know, throughout the twenties and thirties, 
um, were notorious figures. Um, I don't see a lot a positive lot of about Coughlin. I just see him as sort of an awful person. But <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I mean, but but, but and if you go to the shrine of the little <laughs> right, flower, right, right, <laughs> they'll tell you. I mean, right. I've, I've had some of these conversations. Well, I mean, that's you know, true. You know, so you know, so. But but no, it's very complicated. And uh, but I but I think though, gentlemen, I mean, I think that's the that that's kind of I think what we're sort of talking about. I mean, we have to find ways to. Um, share this history with new generations of people and talk about uh, that complicated nature. We just had a former president have a presentation, you know, talking about, and he was talking mainly, uh, Barack Obama mainly talking about the upcoming 2020 elections, and, right. and, and Obama tells a group of people, hey, look, the world is complicated. I mean, you've got some right. actors and, and, and agents who um, have done, who, who are doing and have done some very good things. But yeah, you know, they've also done some, right. some 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 notorious things too. I mean, you you very you very seldom find, uh, you know, an, an individual um, who who isn't uh, like that. And but what I think we have to do is teach, um, and so in a way that uh, that people can discern. Well, let me ask the question slightly differently of all you gentlemen. Um, I totally agree. It's important for uh, African American kids to have a sense of who they are and a sense of their place in the world, but. What about white folks? White folks need to know this history just as much, if not more, than black folks. And how do we, how should we do our curriculum? How should we make them, how can we make folks interested in all of our history? Well, I think one, one approach uh, has to be to obviously incorporate African-American history right. into, say, American history, or, of course, right. in, in general. Uh, and, and not sort of wall it off, as a, you know. Not wall it right. off. What you want to do is, is, is tell whites that uh, what you're doing is really expanding the whole narrative right. and giving them a more full account. Right. Oftentimes, when you study American history, uh, you, you'll discuss events and places and people, but then for some reason, there is something that blocks it all, or there's something about it that's empty or missing. Right. And in many cases, that missing element is African American history. And so when you incorporate that in there, then they get a full understanding of what transpired. For example, what Dr. Lindsay mentioned about George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. In fact, that they were slaveholders, and uh, so on. On the one hand, there's the celebratory history of Washington, Jefferson, and others, but then you come to a certain point in the history where there's there's some gaps there. And you wonder, well, what right. what is the gap? And oftentimes, that gap is the fact that uh, African American history has, has been excluded or washed out of it. When you add an element in there, then you get a better understanding of the events that transpired, and it gives you therefore a better understanding of how we got to where we are today. And so whites have to understand, as well as blacks and other peoples, right. that when you expand the whole narrative, include all the el uh, 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 elements in there, then you get a full appreciation and a fuller understanding of what transpired, and that allows you to make better decisions in understanding the present and for the future. Exactly. And I think that's what whites have to understand, as well as blacks as well. I think Keith said it well. Um, I've been leading... Um, over the last several months, uh, both public and private bus tours um, with, a, with an organization, Detroit Bus Company, and most of the patrons that we have are, are whites, uh, and many of them are new to the metropolitan area. We just took a group of uh, new LinkedIn uh, employees. That LinkedIn has just moved a, an office into downtown Detroit. Uh, we took a group of 40 uh, people, all but one of them, um, um, was, was white. I mean, all, all of them except for one was white. Um, we took we take them to the Bur, uh, the Burwood Wall in Northwest Detroit, right. one of the great symbols of race discrimination. That's where a housing it's developer it. they, they built yeah. this wall to separate a yeah. white housing developer developer yeah, from where blacks lived. Yeah, absolutely, a aided, uh, but most importantly, Jack, uh, equally important, aided by the federal government. It was right. it was yep. FDR's housing policy at the time to create segregated. Uh, public housing projects and 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 and, and back and back uh, mortgages uh, for private projects, but 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 the point I'm making with that is, I mean, you do it at least in my case. I'm not you know I'm not a college professor or a or a public school general superintendent, but we do it um, week by week with with dozens of of, of, of white folk. Um, and what I what I found is at least my experience has been. Particularly with millennials, uh, millennial whites, they, they're eager to learn this history. I mean, there is a there's a sense that uh, many of them are new to Detroit, um, mm -hmm. and they want to understand how the city uh, has evolved over time and some of the challenges that it's faced. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how did they get there? I would give, give Howard Lindsay a chance to weigh in here. Sure, sure. 
I see a problem in some cases of uh, in, incorporating African American history because, and I hate to say this in 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 one sense, but I think all all the uh, learned gentlemen here know this. African American history, when you compare it to white history, is not that pleasant in a lot of cases. No. Uh, there are some very brutal things that the United States has done to people of African descent. And when I teach my African American history course, one of the lectures that gets the biggest um, uh, pushback, or not pushback, I say interest, is when I do a lecture on lynchings. I do a whole lecture right. on lynchings, the, the history of it, and I show some pictures of it. Among the people that are most shocked are many of the white students. Right. Matter of fact, most of the white students. And the question they ask almost incessantly is, why, well, first of all, how could this be done? Right. And the bigger question, why haven't we heard this before? They think lynching is like something in the cowboy movies. Right? Yes, they, but yes, they don't realize yes. that people were set on fire and castrated yeah, and all these yeah. stuff. And then people right. tra treat it as a picnic. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, for, for crimes like reckless eyeballing. Right. And uh, I, I read to them some actual accounts of lynchings. So uh, in one sense, one of the problems I see in, in incorporating African-American history into uh, U.S. history is uh, it's almost like African-American history is the underside of it, that mm -hmm. America seemed like it would like to forget. And to bring this up, you know, and I've, I've had students say, well, you know, this happened in the past, and, you know, why should we forget about it? I said, you know, but it's, it's part of American history. That That's part of the history of the people on this continent. It's like the Germans had to face up to the Holocaust. Yes, and exactly. German kids like, you know, our nation did this. And mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's very much the same, the same thing going on here. Jack, you know, can I say this? I think one of the impediments to to uh, the, um, or, or reservations that whites may have in terms of studying black history, and sometimes many blacks themselves, is that they seem to think that, and, and this goes back to the, uh, a point about Black History Month right. as well, is that they seem to think that when you advocate teaching African American history, that you want to overthrow everything, that you want to kill white people, overthrow everything, and so forth. And uh, I think this this has to be dispensed with. Right. Uh, uh, I think people... Well, or as I was hinting, they think you don't want kids to know anything about George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Just, yeah. You know, it, but, but that's not what it is at all. Exactly. I mean, it, there's a sense of militancy and radicalism, certainly that comes out of the 60s period and right. before that, that's there, which was more of a rebirth of the knowledge that was uh, suppressed. Mm -hmm. But I think people have to kind of get over this idea that because you... You mentioned black history automatically. You want to overthrow everything, kill all white people, and you know destroy the system, and on and on and on. Right. And so it, it, that kind of distorts the whole idea of, of of learning black history. Once people can get past that, then as Dr. Lindsay pointed out, and as Kim pointed out, you know there's a richness there that can really um, uh, explain events and give people well, full sure. appreciation of what transpired, and then give them a knowledge of their own selves as well. I think my, my own, you, you gentlemen are historians, you can contradict me, that, but one thing everyone needs to learn more about is the Great Migration. Detroit was really shaped by the Great Migration. Sure. The, the African-American population, there was almost no African-American population as late as 1910, and Detroit was a small town that they, they made railroad cars and stoves and processed fertilizer, but the African-American, you know, Detroit, modern Detroit's history is really shaped by African-Americans and whites coming in to work in the, in the plants. There's no doubt about it. I mean, uh, Detroit's African-American population skyrockets from about 5,000 in right. 1900 to 120,000 uh, in 1930. The Detroit Urban League, uh, the great uh, human service agency, pointed out that during the 1920s, 1,000 uh, African-Americans were moving to Detroit um, uh, each month. The city was the fourth largest city in America at one point. I mean, only New York, right. Chicago, and Philadelphia were larger. This is before folks went out to Los Angeles. And so right. uh, the African Americans played a major role in, in uh, uh, Detroit's pro uh, prowess and prominence uh, leading up to the arsenal of democracy. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, I'm wondering, as all, all of us are educators, uh, in 1990 you could say pretty legitimately that black folks lived in Detroit, white folks lived in the suburbs, but now uh, there are, I think, just about as many African Americans in the suburbs as there are in the city of Detroit. You know, Wayne, uh, Oakland, and Macomb County now have, you know, substantial over 100,000 African American populations. Is that going to make it easier to sort of teach that we're, you know, teach some of these things? Well, you know, um, I moved from Detroit 
when I, about 1990, and I went to Chicago and taught at DePaul, and I came back about four years ago. I was amazed at uh, how many black folks had gone north of 8 Mile. I mean, right. matter of fact, right now, I live in Southfield. Right. When I got here in 1970, that was almost unheard of. There's um, one half of 1% in 1970, the population of Southfield. It's now 75%. Yeah. Um, in 19, and, and, and to pick up on uh, Mr. Coleman's point, in 1940, Detroit had 120,000 blacks. The black population doubled by 1950 and had almost 300,000. Right. Statistically, whites stopped moving to Detroit in 1940 because mm. the the increase in the uh, population of the city right. in 1940 and 1950 was, was almost it was all African Americans. Almost all about, African Americans. Right. Right. The, Detroit hit its peak in 1950 and then it started to decline. Right. Now, of course, we are the largest city with a black majority, and it's been 80 percent, I think, since about the 19, about 1980. Right. What we have seen is a diminution of blacks in most northern central cities, mm -hmm. a growth in suburbs, and a which is not usually talked about now, a reverse mig well, not a reverse migration, but a migration of blacks from the north to the south. Right. Absolutely. Between Absolutely. between uh, 2010. Between 2000 and 2010, uh, Atlanta replaced Chicago, uh, or metropolitan Atlanta, now has the second largest black population. Those are my black students country. graduating from Wayne State wanted to go. They wanted to go to Atlanta, partly because mm -hmm. there were jobs there. Between, yeah. uh, during, that, during that time period, right. Detroit lost 200,000 blacks, Chicago lost 200,000 blacks, right. metropolitan Atlanta gained 400,000 wow. African Americans. Wow. So... What we're seeing now is a redistribution, you know. The only problem, well, in, in terms of blacks going out to the suburbs, when we t tend to move to the suburbs, we still tend to move in areas that are probably going to be predominantly black mm -hmm. the more blacks move in. Southfield is now predominantly white. Or I shouldn't mm -hmm. say predominantly right. black. Blacks are moving into the suburbs, but as they do, they tend to get clustered also. Well, there's a, there, there was a sociologist in New York University a few years ago who said there's sort of a rule when bl blacks get to be 20% uh, of the population, whites start, they all start leaving. And the, any, any of you see any sign we're getting beyond that? Well, no, no. I mean, uh, I, I'm one of those people that believes that race matters. And, um, and what I mean by that is just the, the illustration of that is what you just said, Jack. I mean, white folk. Um, go pick up and and, <laughs> and create more sprawl. I mean, right. uh, I live I live just outside of downtown Detroit, and 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 the sort of moniker that we've named Southfield is uh, that's the old northwest uh, northwest side of Detroit. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. at least. I mean, I, <laughs> Kim and I, my wife and I, are kind of the last of the <laughs> that's, that's no even. <laughs> Detroiters, most of our friends, we have to drive 30 miles to go visit. Well, um, well you know, black migration in Detroit has <laughs> sort of followed Jewish migration. It, it, it has. Yeah, and, right. and, and, and let's just be clear and point out that the Jews were helpful um, right. collectively mm -hmm. in, in, mm -hmm. in providing uh, 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 residential opportunities for uh, African Americans, rent to own opportunities on the old west side, uh, in the right. northwestern and central high school neighborhoods. Um, you talked. We talked a lot about Southfield, but Oak Park is almost the same. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, Oak Park was a largely Jewish and still has a sizable Jewish population, but but uh, but it's lots of African majority, Americans right? live there. Uh, yeah, black majority uh, certainly now. Yeah, yeah. So that migration mm -hmm. pattern really has mm -hmm. um, has, has been the same. And, and and I would I think that the local history will show us that, that that the Jewish community was very helpful to African Americans at least collectively yeah. in that regard. But before I forget, I want to ask Keith Dye about something. You're, I'm intrigued. You're sort of an expert on uh, reparations, and the reparations movement started in Detroit, I think. I, I read that you, you had done research in this area. Am I correct? Uh, <clears throat> uh, the modern version of it is. Uh, uh, the idea of reparation goes back really prior to the Civil War, as a matter of fact, right. uh, throughout the country. Uh, but in this, in this modern incantation, uh, you'll find that uh, Detroit was one of the sensitive locations for it. Uh, and several organizations emerged at the time, uh, uh, one called NCOBRA, the uh, National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, uh, and you had other groups as well that, that emerged uh, advocating reparations. Um, interesting enough, uh, uh, I did my uh, doctoral dissertation on the uh, Black Manifesto 
uh, which was uh, uh, began uh, in 1969 by James Foreman, an activist, and others in Detroit, started in Detroit. He was out of core, wasn't he? Do I remember that correctly? Uh, Foreman, uh, uh, SNCC. SNCC. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, a student of Violent Coordinating Committee. Yep. And so, and this became a firebrand document that began in Detroit in May of 1969. They had a conference in April at Wayne State. Uh, they released a document demanding $500,000, I'm sorry, $500 million uh, in uh, uh, reparations, and then mm -hmm. it quickly spread throughout the country. And it had about, uh, about two, three years life. Uh, and they got some monies, but it emerged as you know, one of those ideas that this is something that was owed to African Americans because of the, the experience of slavery and oppression after slavery. Now, I, I, when I've traveled in white circles and this is the one issue when you start talking about reparations, people sort of go nuts. And where, how do we sort of get to a, Howard Lindsay, how do we get to sort of an intelligent dialogue about what form reparations should take? I think, uh, picking up on Dr. Dyer's point, you have to call it something else than what it actually right. is. For instance, uh, Obama's um, health care plan. Right. Now, that probably impacted African Americans more proportion than it did white. Because fewer of them had health insurance. Yes, yes. So, in one sense, then, he, he did something for African Americans, but right. whether, he, I don't know if it was in the back of his mind or not, he couldn't present it as that. Right. Uh, if you have a program, let's say, that um, we're going to, well, like I said, universal health care, that could be something. That you could start with, and African, that's going to impact African Americans more sure. so than whites. Uh, you could start something like um, a uh, mortgage program where you would guarantee mortgages as opposed to what some of the banks did, which led to the right. last uh, mortgage crisis. But uh, you know, and, and maybe it's just me and my old age and skepticism. I don't think you could uh, advocate a program that said blacks should be owed money. Right. Although I think you could, you know, there's a, there's enough evidence from it. You say make a case, but politically, in reality, yeah. and then yeah. people people say, well, what about Obama? His ancestors weren't, uh, you know, slaves. Ta da ta da ta da. Right. But, uh, but I think at some point, what do you think? You're, you're a young guy, Ken. What do you think? <laughs> it's all relative, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> my knee, as my knees hurt this morning after running. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I will look. I mean, a, uh, you know, interestingly enough, going back to the local history uh, analysis of this, I mean, uh, a, a lot of us thank uh, the late John Conyers for uh, making this an issue, right. introducing it um, session after session after session, beginning in 1989. Um, the conversation, as we pointed out, has taken on many, um, you know, many sort of ways to uh, one, one whether it's to study the issue. Um, to whether, you know, how it man manifests itself. I, I don't see any, uh, I, I see um, re uh, uh, redistribution of wealth as a non-starter politically. Um, I, I just don't think that, that, that the white community in America is interested in, in anything like that. But something, you know, some, some other type of, uh, you know, opportunity um, um, in terms of reparations, mm -hmm. you know, may have, you know, may, may be, you know, might have an opportunity, you know, have sure. an opportunity to be discussed. But I'm, I'm pretty skeptical about where, where it'll go uh, in this Trumpian <laughs> age that we live in. Actually, this is uh, off the topic a little bit, but I think the biggest uncovered story of the last 40 years has been the redistribution of wealth from the poorer people to the richer people in this country, you know, yeah. black, black yeah. and white. And uh, maybe that's, that's the irony of it, right? rally, rallying a, a cry. Um, yeah, no. but uh, you know we could go on and talk about this all day, but uh, people, but uh, we don't have a whole lot more time. But I'm curious. To, uh, I'd like to ask everybody, we're, um, if there's a book you can recommend the folks. To me, I never understood Detroit till I read Tom Segrew's The Origins of the Urban Crisis. It's a long book. It's a it's a heavy book, but it just sort of some of the things I learned in there blew me away. But can you, uh, other than, of course, your book, you know, this day. <laughs> well, in fact, tell, well, mention Sagru, your book. Sagru, you can plug your book. Yeah, well, no, no, I, Sagru's book is a classic, and I'm glad right. that you lifted it up. I mean, that's, that's the one that I generally uh, go to. But, but, uh, but Arc of Justice. Uh, Arc of Justice, uh, about the Ocean Suite uh, Absolutely. Case, right? Kevin, Kevin Boyle book. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, on the day that we're talking, uh, in 1925, Ocean Suite testifies. 
um, in recorder's court. Um, uh, he and his family and friends are on trial for the death of a, a white man. This is a gentleman who, for the no, uninitiated who bought a, a house in a right. white neighborhood and right. uh, crowd surrounded, and they were getting ugly, and somebody from inside the house shot, and uh, right. a, a, a white guy outside died. That's right, and, and after the second trial, um, uh, sweet uh, family and friends are acquitted. Um, but but the Boyle book, uh, Arc of Justice, not only is, is, a, is a brilliant book that talks right. about that seminal um, seminal case uh, in Detroit and world history, but it also is a great book. Um, I think, gentlemen, you would all agree, a great book in sort of setting the stage for a lot of what we talked about, the Great Migration and the right. Jazz Age and, and, and African Americans moving to this town and, and what they were faced with when they got here. So the Arc of Justice would be my... So, my uh, I, think, so I think it's worth noting, too, at the top of, of what Howard Lindsay was saying about being sort of the darker side of history. Yes, the jury acquitted Ocean Sweet, but his wife died of tuberculosis from yeah. having been in prison, and his yeah. life was sort of ruined. He ended up committing suicide in 1960. So, That's you right. Know, it was That's a, right. Had a broken heart, really. I, I, absolutely. It, it's a very sad story. Howard, yeah. what book would you recommend, other than anything we mentioned? Uh, a book on Detroit? Uh, a book on Detroit or understanding the African American experience. Um, kind of interesting. One of the, one of the books um, that I read recently, and I, I actually use it in class. Um, it's by uh, James Lowen. Sundown Towns. Sundown. Sundown yeah. Towns. Mm -hmm. That sets a. That gives you a picture of what happened next, in essence during the Great Migration. These are towns where they said, if you're black, you better be out of here when yes. the sun goes down. Um, I'm, I must admit, you know, I used to wonder, I said, why is it that black folks don't live all over the place in Michigan? Mm, right. Why is it that, you know, they're concentrated in Detroit, and if, you know, blacks in Illinois are concentrated in, in Chicago, the black folks just like living around other black folks that much? And uh, that book opened up a whole new uh, perspective for me. That kind of uh, explained a lot of these things that happened to black folks and uh, other minorities, Jews also, you right. know, they were excluded. Yes. Um, I think that's, that's one of the, the best books that kind of takes a step back in general from the Great Migration and tells you, puts it in a, a, a macro uh, perspective, and, and you, you could see this happening. It's not only Detroit, it's Chicago, it's Philadelphia, it's New York, right. uh, it's Cleveland. So part of the way that we got to where we are now is um, I think chronicled in that book. Great, Keith. Uh, there are a couple of books. Uh, one by Herb Boyd on Black Detroit, uh, which is pretty good. I haven't finished reading it yet, but it's, it's pretty good. Sure. But I do want to say that uh, there's a book by I think it's Angela Dillard, and I don't recall the name of it, but she she discusses the whole idea of the emergence of slavery in Detroit and traces this is is um, to uh, how it advanced uh, in the city. Uh, on through the uh, 19th century. And that book gives you a very good foundation of the whole idea of slavery being a, almost as much of a, a northern phenomenon as it was in the South. Yeah, we don't think about it being a northern phenomenon, but I yeah, was just, I'm, I'm reading a biography of Benjamin Franklin. He went to England for five years and took his two slaves, took two of his slaves with That's him. That's right. And he's from Philadelphia. Yeah, absolutely. So, But see, these are the tidbits and the... It's much more than just tidbits, but these are things that can be learned um, through reading these books. And uh, so, so Angela's book, Angela Dillard, uh, who's teaches U of M, I think she's out east now. Uh, and I, I don't recall the name of her book, uh, but it's it about came slavery out, uh, in Detroit. Uh, they, yes, they, yes, they it made is. quite a splash a couple of years yep, ago. Exactly, right, exactly. Right. That book will give you a good understanding of the emergence and the beginning point, if you will, of Detroit's history, uh, which has this kind of a kind of a multi-ethnic multiracial background there. and uh, But again, uh, one can get a full appreciation of African-American history and American history, uh, not only with the sources they can and, and, and how it pointed out, but also grabbing a hold of that book as well. Ken Coleman, sitting at home in your pajamas, I imagine. Uh, <laughs> I, give, give, give me the... 
Okay. I would if I get you, away with it. Thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> yeah. I want to give you the final word. Please tell what's the name of, of, of your book, your day-by-day day day book, and, uh, and what's your and, website? Yeah, I, I appreciate it, Jack. Uh, on This Day, African American Life in Detroit. Uh, it's available as an e-book on Amazon and Smashwords and, and other online uh, uh, book dealers, but it, uh, as you, as we've talked about it, it uh, it offers on a daily basis um, great great uh, great moments in African American history in our city. And if you're on Twitter, I'd sign up for follow Ken Coleman because he has some interesting interviews. Thank, thank you so much. Well, thank you. All, all you, Ken Coleman, Professor Keith, Dye, Professor Howard Lindsay, I want to thank you all very much. I could go on talking about the subject all day, but I don't want to wear out our guest. I want to thank them again, as well as everyone who donated to help fund the production costs of this podcast, including. Renee Sebastian, a former student of mine turned social worker, and Julie Greenberg Hazen. You two would like to help to keep these podcasts going. I'd be thrilled if you could send a contribution to me via Zing Media Group, 186 North Main Street in Plymouth, 48170, or message me on Facebook or via my blog, lessonburyinc.com, for more details. Please check out my blog and click the button and subscribe to both my podcast and my other writing. For the Price is Right, it's absolutely free. And listen to more episodes, tell your friends, and feel free to send me a message on Facebook. This is Jack Lessonby with the Politics and Prejudices podcast. I'll be back with my final essay in a moment, and I'll see you again soon. I'm Jack Lessonbury. I'm not black, and according to the Genetic Service 23andMe, I don't have any detectable African-American ancestry. If I did, even if I did, it wouldn't matter much socially. I've always been perceived and lived my life as a white man. You can argue that we're all treated equal now, but I can tell you this. If I go to Somerset Mall and wander around some expensive store, nobody's going to pay any attention to me unless I look like I want to buy something. If an African-American man, like one of our guests today, does that, he's more than likely to feel eyes watching him. While I know a fair amount about the lives of black people in America, I can never pretend that I really know what it's like to be black. But what I do know is that black history is also my history. America is many things and includes many people. But more than anything else, the story of America is the story of the relationship between white people and black people. We're inseparably interconnected. Morgan Freeman, who happens to be one of my favorite actors, was once asked by the late Mike Wallace what he thought of the idea of Black History Month, which we now celebrate in February. Freeman said, I don't want a Black History Month. Black history is American history. He had a point. Segregation of any kind is a bad thing. I'm a Detroiter. I grew up here, and what happened to Ocean Suite when he bought a house in a white neighborhood is part of my history, too, even though I wasn't born until many years afterwards. As a journalist, I'm fascinated and inspired by the story of Robert S. Abbott, a poor black young man from Georgia who became a lawyer in the late 19th century, who was told his skin was too dark to allow him to successfully practice law. So he moved to Chicago, started a newspaper on his landlady's table, and by the 1920s had built his Chicago Defender the most successful African-American newspaper in the country with a nationwide circulation. Pullman porters dropped off bundles of the Defender in southern towns and even cotton fields with train schedules printed to help spur the great migration to transform Detroit and the northern half of this nation. Black history is not monolithic. There are saints and sinners, heroes and scoundrels. What's most important to remember is that it can't be considered in a vacuum. Black America developed along with white America. Ush and Sweet had the courage of his convictions, but he was saved from prison by a white lawyer named Clarence Darrow. Most of the people who voted for America's first black president happened to be white. White America, as so far as that term has any meaning anymore, has to confront its history as well. The fact that none of my ancestors ever owned slaves, as far as I can tell anyway, doesn't excuse me from understanding the white privilege I share. Studying history doesn't have to be pedantic or always painful, however. I prefer to see it as a giant detective story. Detroit has been a big piece of the story for a long time, and we should all know more about that. In any event, it should be pretty obvious that we really can't have any idea where we're going until we know where we've been. I'm Jack Lesenberry. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you again soon.